her child in the valley. So I wrote you down these words. Travel in the fourth regiment, my brothers by my side. On Wednesday, the 2nd of March 1921, one of the headline events of the Irish War of Independence in Westmeath took place here at Mullingar Railway Station when forces of the British Crown caught up with one of the IRA's most effective guerrilla leaders. Sean McKeown, the famed blacksmith of Balnalee and commandant of the IRA's North Longford Flying Column had for so long artfully evaded capture by the authorities and in the meantime masterminded a series of ambushes against members of the Crown forces. On the 2nd of February 1921, a month before the events here in Mullingar, McKeown and his men attacked a convoy at Clonfin in County Longford, killing four members of the Royal Irish Constabulary's Auxiliary Division. It was this sort of devastating activity in what was otherwise a quiet part of Ireland during the War of Independence, which led McKeown to become one of the most wanted men in Ireland. But after a year-long hunt, 100 years ago at Mullingar Railway Station, Crown forces finally got their man. John McKeown spent the morning of March 2nd, 1921 in Dublin, where he had a meeting with Cahill Brewer the Dáil's Minister for Defence. Brewer proposed to McKeown that he take a team of men and travel to London to assassinate members of the British Cabinet. McKeown's good friend Michael Collins, as President of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, overruled Brewer and told McKeown to return to Longford to continue his activities. No sooner had McKeown boarded the evening mail train to the Midlands than he got straight back to work. Eyeing up a party of soldiers who had entered his carriage, he slipped out of the train and picked up a bottle of whisky. McKeown's plan was simple. He would get the soldiers drunk, and on reaching Edgeworthstown, where members of his North Longford flying column were lying in wait, he would ambush the soldiers, take their weapons from them, and take them hostage. McKeown's plan worked well initially. By the time the train reached Caloocan, the soldiers were merry, and they were enjoying the company of this jolly and suave Irishman, and little did they know who they were sharing a drink with. But McKeown's luck ran out when the train arrived in Mullingar. Unknown to the IRA leader, Crown forces had learned all about McKeown's excursion to Dublin. Not only that, they had managed to foil a plan by the IRA to stop McKeown's train further up the line and to facilitate his escape. When McKeown's train arrived in Mullingar, it pulled into a siding and he was dismayed to see that on the platform, not only was it heaving with police, but also from soldiers from 1st Battalion of the East Yorkshire Regiment stationed here in Mullingar military barracks. Passengers were ordered off the train and forced to stand in an identity parade. McKeown's last hope at this stage was that the police would not recognise him. His case was helped by the fact that the ranking police officer on the platform, District Inspector John Harrington, was an informant who was working for Michael Collins. McKeown attempted to evade identification by giving a false name and he probably would have escaped, only for the insistence of an RIC head constable by the name of James Kidd. Kidd recognised McKeown and insisted that Harrington arrest him, otherwise he would report him to his superiors. With the net closing in on him, McKeown had one last trick up his sleeve. He proposed that the police escort him to Edgeworthstown, where several police officers, he insisted, would vouch for the fact that he was not McKeown, but somebody else entirely. What McKeown really hoped for from this scenario was that his men would come out with all guns blazing and effect his rescue. District Inspector Harrington, perhaps suspecting what was in store at Edgeworthstown, decided to keep McKeown here at Mullingar RIC Barracks, or what is now Mullingar Garda Station, for further questioning. McKeown, completely out of options, resolved to die in an attempted escape, rather to be handed over for trial and potential hanging. Now bound with handcuffs, McKeown was led away from the railway station to the police barracks at College Street. Travelling up this slope along the road, he got as far as the Green Bridge, before spotting the chance to make his escape. Swinging his arms wildly, he used his elbows to strike the policeman to his left and to his right, before making a frantic dash for freedom.
bullets whizzed overhead as the police fired at the escaped prisoner. McKeown then darted down Dominic Street and tried to gain access to a premises known as McDonald's Bakery but found that it was locked. He then made what he later told the Bureau of Military History was a fatal mistake. Instead of continuing down Dominic Street, where he had the chance of finding a means of escape, he continued into this small side street here known as Railway Row, past the old Brofels Hotel building which now houses Coppola's Takeaway and Ladbrokes Bookmakers. Here McKeown encountered two policemen who were in the vicinity at the time and had heard of the commotion on Dominic Street. The two constables pulled their pistols and fired at the approaching McKeown, hitting him in the chest and puncturing his lung. He fell to the ground, coughing up blood, but managed to get to his feet again and continue with his attempted escape. Further down the road, however, he ran out of breath and fell to the ground again, where he was surrounded by police, who he later described as a mob of howling savages. Before being moved to the military barracks and eventually to Mount Joy Jail, McKeown was kept here at the RAC barracks, where he was subjected to some severe treatment by his captors, including a beating with rifle butts. According to McKeown's biographer, Mullingar man Porrigo Farrell, the prisoner had a revolver pressed to his head with Crown forces jeering, McKeown the murderer, we have got you at last. But for the arrival of District Inspector Harrington, McKeown later recalled, he probably would have died in police custody. Seriously wounded and in danger of death, McKeown was treated by Dr. Patrick Keelan of Greville Street, which is now Oliver Plunkett Street. And Keelan concluded that the bullet which hit McKeown in the chest had just barely missed an artery. During his time at the RIC barracks, and indeed later on at the military barracks and in Mountjoy Jail, McKeown was regularly visited by members of Come and the Mon, the women's paramilitary organisation which had a strong presence in Longford and Westmead. McKeown's own sister, Helena, was a member of Come and the Mon in Longford. We talked to Helena's son, Andy, nephew of Sean McKeown, about his memories of his uncle, and particularly the events that happened here 100 years ago. My name is Andy Donoghue. I'm living in Castle Pollard. Originally, I'm from Banalee. I'm a nephew of Sean McKeown's. Well, my grandfather and grandmother, of course, were married away back in, uh, I suppose, 1900, because he died in 1913. And, uh, you know, he was only a young man. And uh, so Sean was only a teenager, still a teenager at that stage. But he had to carry on here and support the family, the, the, his mother and family, which he did. At that time, a forge was a great asset, you know, and there was plenty of customers. And even fellows going to a fair in Langford, they could call him at all hours of the night and he'd get up and he'd chew a horse, you know. And uh, he had that name, you know, he was obliged in that way. I remember one Sunday morning I came, went to Mass with my mother. I came out from the church and uh, I was only three or four years old at the time. I recognised him, of course, and ran to him. And straight away he picked me up in his arms. And uh, so when I looked across his shoulder, there those people staring at me, you know. But he had a good grip of me, so I wasn't one bit afraid. <laughs> Well, at Clonfin, of course, he came to uh, unveil the, the statue, the monument, in honour of his fellow men, you'll see. And uh, I happened to be the officer in charge of the Guard of Honour. And I had the honour and privilege of him inspecting, walking along with him as he inspected the guard, you see. And uh, so that's one of my dearest and happiest memories, you know. He was hit by a 45. And you know, he says, when, a 40, when you're hit by a 45, it's fit to lift you off the ground. Because a 45 is, is almost as thick as your finger, you know. It's only short, it's only about that length, it's sort of a thing. It went in, and it just skimmed by his, his uh, vein, you know, a main artery. And then it went through his lung and punctured it. And that lung collapsed then after that. So for the rest of his days, he only had one lung, you know. 
The British government said that uh, the um, people who were elected to Dáil Éireann, they let them out so that they could go in and negotiate for a settlement to here. Except for Michelin, and he was kept. They didn't release him. But straight away, Michael Collins wrote to the um, paper and, uh, and uh, complained. So within a few days, Michelin was released. So fair dues to Michael Collins. As usual, he stood up for his friends and, you know, no hesitation. Sean McKeown went on to have a long career as a TD and later Minister for Defence and Justice. In 1922, he was appointed a general in the National Army and he played a key role in pacifying the Midlands and the West during the Irish Civil War. His political career continued well into the 1960s and in 1945 and 1959, he contested the Irish presidential election. The events of March 1921 lived long in local memory so much so that in July 1973, when General John McKeown died, the Westmead Examiner featured an account of the incident in an article on its front page. <laughs>